Good morning. Uh, I'd like to introduce doc, Dr. Jack Lipton, who will present uh, on his recent work on the uh, testing for uh, coronavirus. Dr. Lipton received his undergraduate and doctoral degrees in psychology and behavioral neuroscience from the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of California, Los Angeles. He studied fetal brain development from in utero cocaine and ecstasy exposure at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, where he held his first faculty position. While at Rush, Dr. Lipton began working with colleagues on the origins of Parkinson's disease. In 2004, he became the director of the Division of Neuropharmacology in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Cincinnati, where the National Institutes of Health awarded him and his colleagues a Morris K. Udall Center of Excellence in Parkinson's Disease Research. In, 29, in 2009, Dr. Lipton brought the center to Michigan State University. Uh, he and established the Department of Translational Neuroscience, which is housed in our Grand Rapids Research Center. Under his continued leadership as professor and founding chair, the Department of Translational Neuroscience has garnered over $50 million in research support since its inception and is currently one of the most research productive biomedical units at MSU. In early March, Dr. Lipton's research team developed a COVID-19 test that is 500 times more sensitive than tests available through a physician's office. Since then, he's called for a pandemic National Guard of Academic Research Lab, prepared and certified to step in during a national health crisis. In the past few months, Dr. Lipton has authored, offered an op-ed on COVID-19 testing in the Wall Street Journal and has been a COVID-19 testing authority on MSNBC, NPR, and Fox News. Today, Dr. Lipton will summarize his work on COVID-19 to date and its potential for large-scale screenings at universities like MSU. Dr. Lipton? Thanks very much for that introduction, Doug, now. Well, thank you all for, for allowing me to uh, give a little update on what we've been doing. Um, the, uh, the theme of my, uh, of my talk is really change. And uh, a lot of what we've been doing ha has been adapting um, to the challenges of testing through just flexible persistence. And so I'm going to go through a little story for you on our, on our work. So I'm going to go through uh, what we've done so far. I'm going to give you the basics of viral testing and then move forward on, on, uh, on our, our story over the last three months. So the first thing uh, I want you to think about is, is what, what is viral testing and how does it work? So I'll go through the basics of this. So you've heard a lot about PCR tests um, in, the, uh, in the news. So I'm gonna give you the, the basics of it, but not bore you. So what do we do first? We collect a sample. The first thing that we do is um, try and get something, a, a sample from a person. Typically, as you've seen in the news, this is through a nasopharyngeal swab. Um, there are other alternatives, including a nasal swab, an oropharyngeal swab, and saliva. We extract that viral genetic material. We transcribe that um, material into something that we can amplify, uh, and then we detect it. And you can see right here in this plot um, what that looks like. What we're doing in, these, uh, in this uh, testing cycle is we're taking that viral genetic material and we're running it through a series of heating and cooling cycles. And each time we do that, the, re the reagents allow us to copy and double the bits of viral genetic code in the reaction chamber um, on each cycle. And this also is tagged with a dye. And this dye makes the material in the tube glow. And as you can see in this picture, over time, if there is viral genetic material present, that glow continues to grow. And this is what uh, we would see if we have viral material present in someone's sample. If we don't, we would have a green flat line across here. And so the first thing that we did, um, because we're neuroscientists, we're not, we're not infectious disease specialists, we're not public health specialists, um, we're, uh, we don't do anything in that area, but we do work with PCR uh, a lot and we do work with viruses. So in the standard platform that I just showed you, um, the, the general reaction is less, is less sensitive. Often people are missed with, uh, with false negatives depending on their viral load. And the data itself isn't quantitative. So you can see we have a, a sample here uh, that says PCR, so this would be the, the material that we start with. Then we get this dull green glow, and we can measure that like I showed you in that curve. We changed our, uh, um, the platform based upon uh, a paper that came out from uh, Wuhan, China, that used a different system called droplet digital PCR that is 500 times more sensitive, um, and it also allows you to see the exact number of viral particles in a sample. And so we happen to have one of those uh, droplet digital PCR systems. We use it 
for developing viruses for gene therapy. And so I spoke to one of my colleagues, Joe Patterson, and the rest of our team, and they were like, we can, we can do this, we can adapt this. And so we decided to, to um, embark on this process, which was, is quite an adventure. So in, let me just tell you a little bit about the difference here. So as you can see in this picture, uh, we end up with this dull green glow. I showed you the curve. Uh, with droplet digital PCR, we take that same sample here and we divide it up into tiny little droplets. And inside each one of those droplets, the PCR reaction that I explained to you occurs. And so each one of those droplets is only big enough to have one piece of that viral uh, material. So one virus basically would, one virus's genetic material would be in each one of these droplets. And if we have one of those uh, droplets and we run the PCR test and there's actually virus in there, you can see we get these little green droplets. And so we can actually count those and this is a much more sensitive way to, uh, to examine this. So we were excited because we're not, we're an academic lab, we're not a clinical lab, and we thought we would be able to offer up this kind of technology to clinical labs. We also understood that there was a change in uh, the supply chain and nasopharyngeal swabs, as we've all heard, were really hard to get. And so that was part of the problems with the backlog of testing. And so for those of you who don't know, sorry about this picture, it's a little gross. Um, nasopharyngeal swabs uh, are used to get a sample um, way back in the, in the back of the throat, through the nose. Um, and we've all seen pictures of people getting these tests. It requires an expert really to administer this test appropriately. It requires an extensive amount of PPE because people are gagging and it's awful. And so people have to be gowned up in order to get this sample. And there's variable quality depending on the technique. If you're not good at this, you might not get a great sample. So we thought about how can we change the sample and make things uh, easier. And so we moved on to saliva collection. And so saliva can be self-collected. And so we have someone spit into a tube um, you don't need PPE to do this, um, and we can get more genetic material collected through this process. Um, we had seen a, uh, a report that was coming out of Rutgers and one uh, from Yale, which showed that spit might be a better sample than nasopharyngeal swabs. And so we developed our own spit kit. And so there are expensive spit kits out there. We didn't want to be um, fighting with uh, uh, the supply chain, so we developed our own. Basically, they spit into a big tube, these conical tubes we use in the lab all the time. We transfer that material with some RNA preservative, we shake it, we label it, and we can run it. We've been validated, we've validated this over the last two months and it works really well. So we've changed the platform, right? We've changed the sample. The next thing um, was uh, to be able to share this, this information with other laboratories, get this test and, and this sample process validated so that we could offer this up nationally. Much to my surprise, I found out that we can't even develop new methods and help clinical labs incorporate these tests to help people because we aren't a clinical uh, diagnostic laboratory. And so there are some, some uh, uh, regulations out there called CLIA, um, the Clinical Laboratory um, Improvement Amendments that decide who can run these tests, but it also decides who can even develop these tests. And so we thought that was kind of crazy. And um, it was really frustrating to know that we couldn't do this and, and offer this up to other people. So we vented our frustration by writing an op-ed to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and it was entitled, We Have a Coronavirus Test, Let Us Use It. I co-authored this with my associate chair and colleague, Carol Sortwell, where we really outlined um, the problems that, that uh, exist in the current federal guidelines uh, that don't allow us to develop these kind of tests. This then got picked up and got national attention. Um, I went on Fox News. I spoke about this on MSNBC. And because we got this kind of attention, um, we were able to uh, um, work together to change policy. So we changed some minds and then we're changing some policy. And so Kathy Wilbur, who is uh, in government relations, worked with us um, you know, at MSU um, to get and assemble a bicameral bipartisan Michigan congressional delegation. Um, we received um, particular help from representatives Alyssa, Alyssa Slotkin and Fred Upton, as well as Senator Debbie Stabenow. Um, and they wanted to help. They wanted to figure out ways that we could do it. They knew they couldn't do this through legislation, but they can uh, work their magic in terms of helping to shape policy in the executive branch. And so what ended up happening was, uh, and we just learned this on June 15th, that an addendum was added to this testing blueprint that was put out by the CDC, the FDA, and the White House on opening up America again. And in this, this particular addendum, they listed many college and university laboratories have multiple high throughput platforms that would enable them to fully test their student bodies and faculties on a regular basis, particularly if incidence of the disease is low enough to enable effective pooled testing 
Individuals or pools that test positive would be sent for confirmatory diagnostic testing by a certified laboratory. This was a huge win for us. This shows that we can utilize academic laboratories to conduct screening. And then if we find someone that's positive, we can send them to a certified laboratory to get tested. So this enables us to open up nationally um, academic labs to be involved in the fight against coronavirus. We took, but in the meantime, when we were still waiting for that to come out, which is our victory in June 15th, we had been doing this work and using our uh, screen in research studies. And so one of the, uh, and I'm going to go through a couple of studies that we've been working on. One, which is really related to, to trying to affect change in the community. We are all part of a land grant university. Our main mission is to help the people of Michigan. And so I think that the importance of utilizing our ability to do this kind of work in the community is really critical. Uh, my colleague, Irving Vega, was the principal investigator on this particular study where we studied asymptomatic cases by screening essential workers in the community in Grand Rapids. We were assisted in this by various organizations that wanted to help us get subjects for our study. And so we had volunteers that came from all of these different organizations who are involved in high contact, high risk contact with people out in the community and have a higher risk of developing coronavirus. And a lot of these individuals are either working with or are from communities of color. And we were able to utilize our test to find positive individuals in the community. And um, I think that it had some real impact. And one quote, which came from one of the, the, um, the organizations that said, thank you so much, Irving, who's our PI, um, for testing the people at San Jose Obrera yesterday. A couple of the part participants called me yesterday to tell me what a wonderful doctor you are and that you took the time to go out into the community to test them. They also said we need more Spanish-speaking doctors like him in the community for our people. Irving Vega is an Alzheimer's researcher, and he's working with us on coronavirus testing. We're all trying to take the expertise that we have to bear and make an impact in the community. In addition, we've been looking at this, at this process and thinking towards the future. And so we've developed another study, which is, uh, was initially IRB approved, and we're looking at turning this from an IRB approved research study now into a pilot initiative to study and screen volunteer asymptomatic workers in the Grand Rapids Research Center, where I am right now. Um, this is the PI of this is Carol Sortwell. And the idea here is to develop and operationalize a process so that we can screen individuals um, that are coming to work on a regular basis and determine whether infections or outbreaks are occurring here. This process also uh, involves us scaling up and changing that throughput. And so in our new uh, process, we are going to be combining materials. We will collect saliva and we would pool those into one reaction chamber for the PCR, like I explained to you before. And if that pool is positive, we know that there's someone in that, in that pool that needs to be tested. But if that pool is negative, um, we can say everyone in that uh, pool is fine. This allows us to conserve reagents, lower the cost of testing, and speed our ability to screen and report positive samples. And this study has been supported by university leaders and members of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. They're very excited that we're doing this. We're working together with the uh, county health department so that if we do find a positive, um, but we have a physician that's part of our, our uh, screening initiative that would then connect any positive people with the Kent County Health Department here in Grand Rapids in order to get them follow-up clinical testing. Now, we've been involved, um, I've been asked to be part of the, the testing subcommittee, which is part of the reopening task force. This is a whole different scale, right? Uh, we're, we're talking about initially working in the Grand Rapids Research Center to test, uh, you know, maybe 100 people at a time. But when we think about the scale that exists at MSU with testing nearly 70,000 people, um, depending on whether they are asymptomatic or symptomatic, it, it's a whole different ball game. And so the reopening campus task force, which we were charged by President Stanley, and this task force is, is led by Drs. Beauchamp and Weissmantel. They've asked us to try and develop a, a COVID-19 detection initiative, which is two main parts. One is testing symptomatic students, employees, and employees. And I've been working with our testing subcommittee and my co-lead, who is Birgit uh, Kushner, the dean of the College of Vet Med. And we're gonna be testing symptomatic students and employees through the standard process um, with clinical diagnostic tests at Olin and in Sparrow. But right now we're trying to scale up um, and develop a contingency plan for a biweekly voluntary screen for students and employees that are at highest risk for transmission or at high risk of susceptibility to significant disease using academic laboratories, saliva samples, and pooling strategies. Now this may, may or may not occur, but we need to be ready to, when we are called upon and so we're in the process of planning this and we've been authorized to move forward 
to get ready in case we're needed. So that's pretty much uh, the story from my living room for the last three months. Um, I want to acknowledge a few people. So our research team, which includes Carol Sortwell and Joe Patterson, two faculty members in our department, Irving Vega, who was the community uh, PI of that study I told you, and then several uh, um, research staff, and then also the original members of the testing committee who've really been important in helping us to develop the, the throughput and think about these processes because we're only experts in PCR, we're not experts in, in all of these other areas. And so this group has been really critical in our work as well. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Dr. Lipton. Uh, do members of the board have questions for Dr. Lipton? I do. I have one question. Doc, thank you. That, that was wonderful. What is the committee? Um, how do you guys feel about uh, herd immunity and uh, doing something similar uh, that I believe Switzerland did, where they quarantined uh, the sick and the elderly and let everybody else develop uh, that herd immunity? I mean, is that is what we're finding? I mean, it seems like uh, the younger population, most of them tend to be asymptomatic. And um, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Well, I'm not an infectious disease specialist, but but I will give you um, my thoughts on that. I don't think that a herd immunity strategy is really a, a viable option. The problem that we have is that young people um, may end up being asymptomatic, but they are interacting with everybody else. And the uh, at what for a while there was some uh, guidelines that came from the CDC that said if you're 65 or older, you know you should be really careful. The newest guidelines that just came out. Um, so this is a continuum of risk as you get older. We don't have a cutoff saying old people are at risk, young people are not. Um, and we're seeing people that are getting strokes at 29 years old. Uh, so I, I'm very reticent to do that. I think what we really need people to do is to follow social distancing, use PPE, um, and be very careful about where they're going in enclosed spaces. And I think we can continue to function appropriately while still using those guidelines. If people are just adhering to them, I think we would do a lot better. So amen, amen to that uh, by me. So I, I agree totally. Thank you. Um, other questions? I would just say, Dr. Lipton, that it's, you know, thank you for your research presentation today, but it is just amazing the work that has gone on at Michigan State and our, our impact as we learn more about the coronavirus and just the strength and the, the reach of research universities. So I wanna thank you and collectively all of those researchers across our university that stepped up and helped and tried to make a difference as we embarked on this unprecedented times with coronavirus. Thank you, thank you very much. And there are so many studies that are going on on campus. Um, I couldn't name them all, but I've been interacting with so many other individuals that are developing tests and trying to come up with solutions. And the, I'm just the tip of the iceberg, so thank you. Any other questions? I just wanted to say, Dr. Lipton, thank you so much. I'm continually impressed with the work that you guys are doing in Grand Rapids. And again, appreciate the tour that you gave to Trustee Scott and President Stanley and I at the beginning of this year. But this is a really, really cool uh, thing that you guys are doing and appreciate all your work. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank I you would echo the TV. sentiments of Trustee T. Bay. I was like, that is a familiar face. I met him. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Lipton. I think Thank little did we know. When we, yeah, sorry, Dinara. Little did we know when we took that tour that we'd be meeting again under these circumstances. But I'll just echo what everyone has said. We're we're very proud of the work that's going on in MSU right now that really is having an impact. And I think when people talk about the value of research universities, uh, this unfortunately this crisis has really driven home again how important we are not only to the nation but right in the communities we serve. We're making a difference. So thank you for all of your efforts.